What a difference a week makes, huh? Last week we were wondering if we were going to be able to drive across the state. And I must tell you, by the time we, when we left on Monday to go home, it was like uh, night and day. We uh, drove on dry pavement most of the way, and it was beautiful. Coming this, coming this way, we drove on dry pavement until we got to that curtain. And Don, you probably remember this, that curtain that's there at Hood River, where the rain starts all the time. You know, it, and it started raining at Hood River again. But I want to do something a little bit, a little bit different this morning. Um, I want to talk... I want to talk about us. I, I want to talk about where are we at as a, a body of believers. My dad this morning said, well, I can answer your question, the state of the church. He says, the church is fine. It's some of these other things that people call church that isn't so good. A and that's true. If we read the New Testament, we will find that uh, Paul in, in Philippians talks about how wonderful uh, the church is. And in Corinthians, he's saying, hey, you bunch of idiots. You know, what in the world are you doing the things that you're doing? Why are you behaving in such a way? And why are you allowing that type of behavior to take place within you? I read an article uh, that was written by a minister in, in Kentucky at a, at a large mega church there, and he was, he was lamenting the state of the church. And I think he was lamenting a little bit about himself. You know, there was a time in America where we had what was called the black coats. And the black coats were the were traveling preachers that would go from town to town on a horse, usually getting paid uh, by just having a place to sleep and food to eat. But they were very influ influential on the morality of the country. And what they had to say was often listened to and, and respected. And this person was lamenting the fact that preachers are okay to do weddings and funerals, but please don't tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. You know, go ahead and, and do my wedding, and, and when the time comes, do my funeral, but don't, don't try to instruct me on my moral behavior. And there's a reason why that's hard for people to listen to because we have all read the, the large stories about preachers who have had all sorts of issues from stealing people's money uh, to sleeping with anybody in the congregation that would sleep with them. You, you name it. And so often preachers are looked at like used car salesmen. And that isn't very respectful. But often that is the fault of the individual, not the overall deal. That, not the overall deal in the church. The, the, other, the other thing that the person was lamenting a little bit about was the way that we treat prayer. And he says, if you've ever been to South America or to Africa, you would find that prayer is altogether different It's not an issue of, you know, of asking God to take care of us and bless our food. It is crying out to the, to the God of the universe to come and to help and to be with them and to, and to be in their midst. Prayer in, prayer in Africa amongst the, the native people of Africa can sometimes be scary. Because they expect something to happen. They don't go to prayer just, oh, yeah, we, we do this. We, we have an opening prayer, and then we, we're going to sing a song, we're going to have a prayer, and the preacher's going to get done, we're having our prayer, and then, and then we're going to go home, and 
and you know it's just something that we do no they expect something to take place when they pray and it often does but we in our we in our western culture have come to the point where we we think we know better you know we have become so much more wise uh, we're, we're more enlightened than we used to be and really what we've done is we've replaced the light of God with a 15 watt light bulb and we think we're a lot smarter and we show ourselves to be not nearly as wise so what's this, what is the state of the church in Willamina well if we were to look at the if we were to look at the financial statement of the church, we'd say, we're in pretty good shape. You know, we got, we got money to pay the bills. Uh, we got some money in the bank. You know, the, the building's paid for. You know, things are taken care of. We, we got lights. Financial, from a financial point of view, yeah, the church itself is in pretty good shape. Now, I'm, you know, the interim minister. I can get away with saying some things that other people probably couldn't. Uh, but we could be in better shape. And we could be better in better shape if all of us really believed uh, that tithing was something that we should do and was something that we practiced on a regular basis. And we, and we did that. I've always made it a habit of only preaching one sermon on money, money every year when I, when I was preached. I had only one. So this is it for you folks. Uh, this is the one. I'm just going to tell you flat out, if you're not tithing, don't come to me and ask me why you can't pay your bills. Because I can tell you why you can't pay your bills. God will take care of you if you take care of him. I've just seen it too many times. So that's that's my big deal on that, and I, I encourage you to come, and, and, and if you want to question me on that, come and question me on that. But I can give you examples from my own life, and I can give you examples from other people's lives. So the, financially, the church is okay. But the day is going to come, brothers and sisters, when you're going to have to pay a preacher full time. And you can't, you can't pay a preacher $45,000 a year and think that you're paying him enough for him to live on. Because half of that, more than half of that in Willamina, in talking to my family that live here, more than half of that would go for housing. By the time a place was rented or bought and you paid the utility, your water bills suck. <laughs> That's three times that word's been used this morning in church too. But Your water bills are horrible. Just think about it. Think of, look at your own home budget of what you have to pay. And, and many of us, fortunately, many of you own your own home, so you don't have to pay. You know, it's already yours. You don't aren't paying the bank or you're not paying a landlord to live there. So $45,000 ain't going to cut it. Especially if you want to hire a young minister who's handsome and, you know, he's got, uh, he's six foot one and weighs 175 pounds and uh, he's got a wife and two kids, $45,000 isn't going to cut it. You're going to have to double that. And just That's reality in the world in which we live. So is the church in good shape financially? Yes. Now, do, can the church be in better shape? Yes. Is it going to have to be in better shape? Yes. Okay. That's the physical side. Spiritual side. We really don't like it when somebody tells us we're wrong. We do not like it at all. How do I know that? Because I don't like it. I don't like it when my wife tells me I'm wrong. I don't like it when my brothers or sisters would tell me I'm wrong. I don't like it 
when somebody else out tells me I'm wrong. I don't like it. And I'm, I'm no different than you when it comes to that, but sometimes the best thing that can happen to us is somebody tell us, Ray, Barbara, Connie, Billy, you're wrong. That's sometimes the best thing that can happen. I can tell you many years ago, uh, and it was many years ago because I was only 33 years old, I had a very good friend of mine. There was a huge row going on within the church, and a good friend of mine came up to me and said, Ray, you are wrong. He risked his friend, my friendship. He risked all of that because and he was right but I was wrong we don't like it if somebody points out an error in the way that we're living our lives in the way some of you are already upset because I said you need to be tithing but I know that but that's okay I'll risk that because I think the Bible teaches us to do that but it also teaches us some other things in the way that we're supposed to live our lives. That we're supposed to live our lives morally well. That, that would mean that two people living together is not a good thing. It's not what God wants. It's not something that we should um, be pleased with and happy about as a church. And in fact... Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, when he talks about somebody who's doing an immoral thing, he tells the church that you need to just kick them out for the purpose of saving their soul. You see, when somebody points out something wrong to us, it, we, sh we should look at it why we need to look at the motive, of it, and our motive has to be right. If we tell somebody they're wrong, why are we doing that? Are we doing that so that we can be judgmental? Are we doing that so that we can lift ourselves up higher? Or are we doing that because we love them so much and care about them so much that we want their soul to be saved? And Paul also goes on to say in that uh, fifth chapter of Corinthians, he says to the people there, he says, what in the world are you judging people outside of the church for? God will take care of that. The people that we are to, to look at and to, to judge are our fellow brothers and sisters. And we do that so we can save their souls, so that we can help them in their walk with God. I don't know all of you very, very well. No, some of you I know better than others because I've been able to spend a little time with you. But some of you I, I know very little about. In fact, I find out news on, on Facebook. I don't find it out from you personally uh, but uh, so if you feel like you're being stalked on Facebook it's because you might be uh, but you need to you need to be honest with me and I need to be honest with you in the way that we live our Christian lives in the way that we live out our life in front of people, and then we need to, if need be, correct one another. I will tell you how, how, how bad it is that we won't, don't want to tell people how they should live their lives or what they should do. Uh, I had someone come to me yesterday, and they said, what are we supposed to do when all these homeless people on the corner when does it when does it end when as a christian how much what am i supposed to do am i supposed to hand out 50 dollar bills to them am i supposed to be so supportive of the state and the you know that they want to you know build them new houses and where where does our christianity end when it comes or or does it end when it comes to that and the answer I gave, well, I think everyone has to make their own mind up on that, and, and their, their response was, that's not what I wanted to hear. And I understand that. I think, I think they're right. I've, I personally have, have handed out $5 bills and $10 bills to people. You know, the guy comes across the parking lot with a gas can saying, I need 
gas for my car. I can't go anywhere. I need gas for my car. Well, here, here's five bucks. That was when five dollars would buy you three gallons of gas, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, what happened the next Sunday night when I was coming out of Marie Callender's after eating a piece of pie and having coffee with friends? The guy comes walking across the parking lot. Same guy with the same gas can. I didn't give him any money that week. In fact, I told him he was trying to scam me. But where do we, where do we end that? I don't know. I think that I really do think it is something that we, we personally have to make a decision on. But I've had also had people say, well, you know, once I give them the money, what they do with it, that's between them and God. That's not between me and them. I like that attitude. It's not mine, but I like that attitude. I think there's some great deal there. When we look at the state of the church in America, the church is declining. The Christian churches and churches of Christ are losing membership at about a rate of about eight, eight to nine percent a year. Why is that? When the Christian churches, churches of Christ in, in Africa, Southeast Asia are exploding. Why, why is that? I think it's because we've lost our way when it comes to doctrine. We've, we've lost our way when it comes to what we believe and what we teach. Is God God? That's a tough one. That, that, is, that literally is a tough one. But if God is God, I'm not. And I have to look then at what he has asked and said for us to do and for us to teach. I think that, I believe that we have, have lost our way on some of our, our doctrines. Joel was going to sing a, a song today. They were going to sing a song and they decided not to called Same God. You know, the same God that helped Moses get across the Red Sea. You know, the, the same God that, uh, that uh, helped David slay the giant. The same God that raised Jesus from the grave. That's the same God that we serve today. He hasn't lost any power. He's not less than he was then. He's the same God. I don't believe that we ought, often in the church that does not get taught. The Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness. When was the last time we've heard or preached a sermon on the Holy Spirit? Well, we can't do that because, you know, the, the people at the Assembly of God Church, they have kind of they have kind of spoiled that with all the speaking in tongues and the Toronto movement and all the different things that have taken place in the last years. So we have, we then, what we have done in the Christian churches and churches of Christ is we have compartmentalized uh, the Holy Spirit and we said, okay, we're going to put this in the box here and we'll set it in the corner and we're not going to talk about it. Well, if we say to serve the same God, then the same Spirit is still alive and well today also. That could be why when we pray, often nothing does happen. Because we don't expect the Spirit of God to be active and as sharp as a two-edged sword, like it said it is. Just, just saying, we need to be people who believe in God and believe in the Spirit of God, and then it, it works today. We want to change people's lives, then we need to allow, allow the Spirit that, with, that is given to us to be seen by the people around us. 
and live in that way. So the Spirit is not preached and taught and depended upon the way that it should be. And so I would encourage us to have a different attitude about it. I would encourage each one of us to have a different attitude about God's Spirit and seek it out. Invite it to be within us. Invite it to be a part of our lives on a daily basis. Because we as the church need it desperately. I hit on prayer, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that one for right now. But one of the other things that is a struggle within the Christian churches and churches of Christ is how does one get the grace of God in our lives? How do we get forgiveness? How do we get uh, the Holy Spirit to live within us? And it, I find this is one of the more amazing things that I find in the Christian churches, churches of Christ. One of the hallmarks of the Christian church, churches of Christ under Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone was the issue of baptism. That was, that was one of the things that made us different. Is that we taught that baptism was necessary. It was a part of the salvation process. Yes, I'm a firm believer that you can go under a wet center or a dry center and come up a wet center. I'm, I'm a firm believer that I'm, I'm saved, I'm saved by faith. But not faith alone. Because I, I, I read certain pieces of scripture. I read Acts the second chapter. And I read Acts, the 19th chapter, when, when Paul asked them, well, you haven't heard of the Spirit? No, well, what, what were you baptized in? Well, we were baptized in John's baptism. Well, John's baptism was not the baptism of Jesus Christ. John's baptism was not the baptism of Acts, the second chapter. Peter said, and Peter said to them in 1 Peter, he said, well, just as Noah was saved by the water, we too are saved by water. In baptism. So I'm, I'm just here to tell you folks, you, you can not like me. You can ask me to never come back again. That's fine too. But baptism is a necessary part of the salvation process. And if you haven't been baptized, then you may have the absolute right to wonder, ooh, I don't have the Spirit. You're right, you don't. You're not promised the Spirit without baptism. Act, read Acts second chapter, verse 38. Read, read, read what uh, takes place with the, uh, in each one of the con uh, conversion stories in the book of Acts. I'm just, just letting you know that. And yet, within people that I have associated with, different churches who would tell you that uh, baptism wasn't something that they needed to do, would, will, off, would, will come to me, and they say, well, Ray, why, why do you teach baptism? And then I tell them, I say, oh, wow. I need to teach Heart Street Tech teaching that in my church. Yeah, you need to teach that in the Pentecostal Church of God. You need to teach that at the, the Baptist Church in Prairie City, Oregon. You need to teach that at the Assembly of God Church. So one number, and again, doctrine-wise, we have to we have to teach what the Bible says. I, I I always tell people it this way. When it comes to the issue of doctrine, when it comes to the issue of baptism, if Peter, on the day of Pentecost, would have told the people. You need to go stand on your head in the northeast corner of the building for 15 seconds. 
Do you know what I'd be teaching today? You need to go stand on your head in the northeast corner of the building for 15 seconds. And for some of us, we might need some help to do that. <laughs> but that's still what I would teach because that's what the Bible would have told us needed to be done. And I would, my wager would be, if I was a betting man, my wager would be that every conversion story then that you would read in the book of Acts, the people would be standing on their head in the northeast corner of the building. Because they would have understood and not tried to, to make it say something else. Uh, I want to I finish with a piece of scripture that is uh, not, uh, not real pleasant. Where's my phone? Come here a minute again. It's his birthday today. So he's, he's yeah, he's, he's really smart. Can you get that so it's going this way again for me? Okay, thank you. <laughs> he's 13, I'm 70, okay? You saw the difference right there. Thank you. I'll shake it harder next time. This is, what, this is what Paul writes to the Corinthian people in the first, the first letter he writes to them, and in the fifth chapter. And he writes this, and understand that they, even after this, they still love Paul. He writes them another letter in the second chapter, and he writes them more, it's a much more encouraging letter than this. But he says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. Holy Toledo. In the church. In the church. The sad part about this is not that this is taking place in the church. And this is, this is what I want to close it with. This is, that is not the sad part. The sad part is that what he says in the first part, it is tolerated. You're putting up with this. You're exposing your young women and young men to this. You're exposing your children to this. As if it's okay. And he goes on to say, no way. No way. You need to call this person out, and if they don't change, you don't have anything to do with them. Don't invite them to dinner. Don't go have coffee with them. Don't even say hello to them on the street until they change the way that they're acting and living. And then he goes on to say that when that happens later on, he says, when that happens, you just invite them back and treat them like your brother in Christ, like that they are. The hard part for Christians is to live up to the expectations of Christ himself. Let me tell you this, your neighbors know how you're supposed to act. And they will throw it at you. Oh, you're a Christian? And you do that? You're a Christian and you, and you said that? You're a Christian and you posted that on Facebook? Your neighbors know what you're supposed to live like. And they expect you to live in that way. And they don't understand grace. And they don't understand forgiveness. And they don't understand that, but we do. And so for us to make it work, then we have to show them grace and show them forgiveness, whether they do to us or not. You know, Families can have terrible fights. 
families can have trouble. I, I, I witnessed a father and a son yesterday go at it. My brother's two beagles, dad and son, and I mean, they went at it. There, there was blood involved in this. There was, there, there was, dad got his backside kicked. It, it was not good. And it's kind of comical when it's two dogs. It's not comical when it's in the family of God. And we can't, we cannot allow that to take place within our, our family because if we do, guess what happens? That person down there at Coyote Joe's that you might have coffee with once a week or once a month, they're not going to believe anything you got to say. Because what you're saying doesn't match up with what you're doing. And they, the world knows before you do what happened in the church. So we have to be, a, again, we have to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. We have to be a place where it's okay for us to have our our good days and our bad days, it's got to be a place where it's okay for us to fail and it's okay for, where it's okay for us to succeed. We have to be that. We, have to, we need to love each other no matter the case, maybe. And, and people say, you know, I have, you know I, have to, I have to love you. You know that, right? I have no choice in the matter. I have to love you. Because God told me I did. I may not like some of the things you do. If you put coconut on a chocolate cake, I won't like that. <laughs> but there are some other things that you may do I may not like too. And so if, if I see it and I call it out, it's not because I don't like you. It's, not because, it's because I love you so much I don't want you to be lost. And so I would, I would expect you to point out to me the things that I'm doing wrong so that if when I am or if I am doing something wrong, and if you don't think I do, just ask my wife. She will tell you when I do things wrong, and because I do things wrong. Okay, this is public. Sometimes Rhonda is right. <laughs> Not all the time. Sometimes she is. And brothers and sisters, sometimes you will be right and sometimes you'll be wrong. Sometimes I'll be right and sometimes I'll be wrong. But through the grace and the mercy and the love of God, we all have had the opportunity to be made right. The state of the church, I think it depends on who you ask. I, I really do. I think it depends upon who you ask. You ask the preacher at a mega church who's going through all sorts of trials and tribulations, he will tell you the church, eh, not so good. You ask the, the young preacher who's been preaching for seven or eight years and the church is loving and caring for him and taking care of him and his family, guess what he's going to tell you? church is pretty good you ask the person that this list just this Friday night Friday night between Lexington and Hepner Oregon two cars ran together head-on killed three people I know and what I have watched is people in the church people in the community throw their arms around family and love the daylights out of them. Whether they went to church with them, whether they worked with them, whatever the case may be. Some kids are, people are without their parents, their grandparents, and their great-grandparents today. Horrible. 
tragic. A little boy that comes to our vacation Bible school the last two years, his mom is, is now dead. Tragic. Horrible. It's horrible. But what would be worse is if the church didn't behave like the church is supposed to behave. Let's pray, and then Carl's got something for you this morning. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you. I thank you for this body of believers, and I, I thank you for, you for your church worldwide. Lord, help us uh, to always strive to do our best uh, to live as you have asked us to live, to follow your word as you have asked us to follow. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In the morning when I